transgressions and regressions. And uh, hopefully we'll weave this in. Uh, but let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask God to bless uh, the lesson this morning and also the rest of the service. Praise God. Uh, Brother Hoover, would you lead us in prayer today? Everybody said amen. Praise God. We want to look to the scripture today uh, in the book of Acts. First of all, uh, chapter 4 and verse 13 uh, is kind of a focus verse. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Then go into Acts chapter 2 and verse 36 through 39, some uh, very familiar scriptures. Uh, Peter speaking here. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and unto your children and unto all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Then moving to... Acts chapter 4, verses 9 through 14, uh, this being uh, Peter's response to the Sanhedrin council when they were called in uh, in questioning of their preaching Jesus in the temple after Peter and John had, uh, through the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, healed the man who had been lame from, his, uh, from birth. Here's Peter speaking, verse 9. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus." And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. And then Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'm not uh, uh, what I would classify as a bold type of person. I'm, I'm generally speaking laid back. Uh, I, I oftentimes find that when I get bold, I get in trouble uh, because it's, uh, well, my dad used to say when we were kids, he'd say, keep your big eyes open, keep your big ears open, and keep your big mouth shut. And uh, I probably am too quiet. And there's times when I know that I have uh, uh, passed up opportunities by being a little rest, reticent, you know, to, to come out and, and say what's really on my heart. But uh, I hope to get some of it out today, praise God. Uh, I don't know how many of you were here Wednesday night when uh, Pastor showed us a, a video, uh, but if you weren't here, I would encourage you to 
talk to pastor and find the source where this came from. I don't know if it was off of YouTube or where it came from, um, but it was an astounding video. Uh, one of the most astounding things I've ever seen uh, in, in, uh, in a video presentation like that. And uh, it, was, uh, it was by a man by the name of Jonathan Kahn. And uh, I've got his original book here that he wrote, which is called The Harbinger, or Harbinger, however you say it. And uh, uh, this was written a number of years ago, and he's written another one since then. And uh, in this book, he basically talks about the nation of Israel and how they went into decline and how they went and met disaster by turning away from God, that they had started out uh, particularly and peculiarly blessed by God. It was to the nation of Israel that the scriptures of the Old Testament were given, and, uh, and they really, if they did nothing else good, they've done a very good job of preserving them uh, for all of mankind. Uh, uh, just an example, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found like in 1947, uh, almost 2,000 years after the Jews hid them, seeing that their nation was coming to total destruction. Uh, when those copies were found uh, in caves there in the Judean wilderness, compared with the modern copies of the scripture, that have been preserved by the Jewish people for years and years, they find that there's no deviations of note between the 2,000-year-old stuff and the stuff that we've got able to read today, if you speak Hebrew or uh, so on. They've done a good job at that, but they did a very poor job of obeying God and uh, consistently got worse and worse until the point that God took his hedge of protection away from them and he did it in a gradual manner not all of a sudden but he did it in a gradual manner to the point that finally when they persisted in worshiping idols and turning away from God that the nation was destroyed and the people were carried into captivity and uh, and he draws a direct connection to the United States and uh, he says that uh, that the United States is a nation that also was blessed by God from its founding and that the founding uh, fathers of the United States were extremely committed to the scriptures. Uh, one example uh, would be the Liberty Bell, the famous Liberty Bell. It was actually cast in 1751, about 25 years prior to the War of Independence, that it has an inscription on it from the book of Leviticus on the Liberty Bell, uh, talking about uh, the, the uh, proclaiming liberty to the land and to all the inhabitants thereof. This is part of the, the jubilee process that's, uh, that's an ancient thing. I've just finished uh, completing a whole book about that, uh, which I haven't let out yet, but uh, anyway, He's also written a new book, uh, Mr. Kahn has, and uh, I don't have a copy of that. I haven't seen it. The first I heard of it was in this video. And, and in this one, uh, he draws a comparison to the apostolic witness. When you go back into the New Testament, now this man, Mr. Kahn, is a messianic Jew. He is Jewish, but he believes in Jesus. He's been baptized in the name of Jesus. He's been filled with the Holy Ghost, according to pastor. And uh, he is part of a group of Jewish people who are thoroughly uh, involved in the faith of the Lord Jesus and in believing in the New Testament and, and, uh, and so on. And uh, he says that when Christianity first came on the scene, Jesus was Jewish, all of the original apostles were Jewish, and uh, a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith in the early days, and 
everything, all the New Testament scriptures were written by Jewish people, and that everything as far as the, the transfer of the gospel message over to the Gentiles was done by Jewish people that did the transferring back then. It was the Apostle Paul and it was uh, various other people, uh, uh, Apostle John and Peter and different ones that went to the Gentiles, Peter being the first one that went, and uh, using the keys of the kingdom that he was given. All the Christianity, the founding, the basis of it, the beginning of it, came from Jewish people. And he is making the contention that as we're wrapping up towards the events that are foretold in the prophecies in the Bible, that uh, we're coming to the close of an age, that it is going to be Jewish people that are going to take into uh, account the ending of the process, that God is turning back to the Jewish people in a gradual process, and it's going to be Jewish people that are going to take the gospel to Israel, and they're going to, they're going to complete the process that God is doing. And uh, we don't have time today to go into the whole thing, but it was really an amazing presentation. And while I was sitting there uh, listening to the presentation, a brother uh, spoke to me and said, you know, this contradicts a whole lot of teaching that I've had uh, in the past because a lot of people have got uh, ideas in their mind of how everything is supposed to set up. And uh, their ideas may be good ideas, but if it's your idea... It's your idea. But when it's God's idea, that's another completely different story. And God has surprised a lot of people over the years with some of the things that he's come out with. And I told him at the time, I said, brother, you know, I think uh, it would be of a benefit to you to read a couple of books uh, that I, I wrote in the past that uh, touch on this subject. And uh, with Mr. Khan talking about how the United States is turning away from God, that uh, they recently, uh, it, in the, in the uh, Supreme Court decisions, uh, ruling against the Defense of Marriage Act, and in the, uh, uh, in the process of doing that, how they not only said that it was unconstitutional. I don't know which part of the Constitution they read to find that, but they said it was unconstitutional uh, not to allow gay marriage. But uh, uh, they also have gone so far as to say that if you don't go along with that, you're a criminal yourself. And he said that, that we've reached uh, uh, one of these famous tipping points where, you know, it was only a few years ago that... Uh, it was a very small percentage of Americans that agreed with that prospect of uh, the LGBT uh, system and all this kind of thing and gay marriage. And now they say that, uh, according to polls, that it's crossed over the halfway point, that more than half of the people in the United States are now in favor of uh, all this taking place. And, and he pointed out that when it moves that direction with the Supreme Court saying some of the things they've said, that there's going to be more and more, uh, if I uh, can use the word persecution, against people. You know that it's right now in Canada today against the law to say anything negative about uh, that process? You can actually go to jail for you know, reading out of the Bible the things that it says, you know, if, in a strict interpretation of Canadian law. But, uh, you know, we're headed in a direction that is not good. And um, anyway, I, I pointed out to him that I had written a couple of books. One of them, uh, I think there have been a lot of copies of that went out here 20 years ago when I wrote this one. Another Little Horn is a talking. I'm not here to sell books today. I'm not, if, I, if you want one, I'm not going to sell you one. I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm just pointing out 
this book, Another Little Horn, is a book that I wrote 20 years ago identifying that the United States is not the all wonderful thing that, you know, that we have held from my childhood, you know, the USA and wave the flag and, and, uh, and so on. I mean, I count myself privileged to be an American, but the things that the United States is doing, the direction that they're going, I mean, you go back to 1954 when they banned God out of the schools, and they go back to the 70s when they brought in abortion, you know, and when you coming now to a lot of things that the American government <clears throat> is coming out with that's contrary <clears throat> to the word of God. And the way that the American public is going, that years ago, uh, there was a, a wide spectrum of people that, that lived a holy lifestyle. And uh, it's getting now to the point where there's very few. And uh, anyway, the direction that the U.S. is going is not a good direction. And anyway, I wrote about a lot of those things 20 years ago, and they're more and more apropos today. And then I also told him about another book that I wrote about nine years ago, and uh, it's called The Power of a Violent Sacrifice. And this is basically a story about the life of Stephen, and, uh, and how he was uh, stoned to death. And, uh, and in it, basically, is a prediction, and I told him about this Wednesday evening, that this book basically predicts that uh, Satan, who is behind the evil, Satan is uh, uh, the troublemaker, he's the murderer, he's the thief, and, uh, and a lot of the things that you've been seeing in the news, uh, you know, these people that seem to be insane, busting into schools and killing a bunch of children and uh, doing horrible things. And you see these people going into shopping malls and shooting. You see people, uh, you know, a few years ago, there was a two, two men that... Uh, were trading places in the trunk of their car with a rifle, shooting innocent bystanders, and they killed quite a number of them. And, uh, and you get all these people going out and killing people and then committing suicide and, and so on. And I made the point in the book that Satan is our enemy. His natural focus that he hates, the ones that are really trouble to the devil that he really wants to hurt, is not these little school children that the, I believe devil-possessed people are going into the schools and killing school children. That's not the focus that Satan's after. Satan's true enemies is the Christians. His true enemies is the people that are holding on to God, people that are filled with God's spirit. That's the ones who Satan really has got it in his mind that he is after. And a lot of times the prayers of the saints have kept things from happening but I told him, and I predicted in this book a few years ago, that this is the future. What is going to happen? When I wrote the book, at that time, there were 10 Baptist churches in the, in the south, in the Bible Belt of the South, that were burned in two, two weeks' time by some people who were later caught for doing it. And uh, shortly after I wrote the book, there was a man who I was uh, friends with, and uh, I had done work with him down south, and uh, he was a preacher of the gospel, a UPC preacher, and he had a son that went wayward, and he had built a church with his own hands. He was a very good carpenter. He built a church in Maine and uh, with his own hands, and he was pastor of it for a while and turned it over to someone else. And this son, who went off the deep end, went up there to the church that his dad had built, and went inside the church in the middle of the night, broke in, poured gasoline all over the place, poured gasoline evidently all over himself, and burnt himself to death and burnt his dad's church down. And anyway, the prediction that I made in this book, and I told 
the brother Wednesday night that this is going to happen. This is something. Something is, this is, you know, I made the prediction that we can expect the future, that Satan is going to be zeroing in on the churches. Little did I know that while I was talking to him, this thing in Charleston was taking place, South Carolina, where uh, a madman came in and actually had the temerity to sit through a whole prayer meeting of an hour's length and then pulled out a gun and killed nine people. And the world is not headed, you know, for uh, pie in the sky, you know. What, what is heading the world? The Bible talks about men's hearts, failing them for fear, for looking on the things that are coming on the world, seeing what's happening, the direction that things are going. And, and I don't feel fearful in my mind. I feel about the power of a violent sacrifice, that there is things. You know, the Muslims say that you Christians, your, your religion is deficient. You, your, your God tells you that you should turn the other cheek if someone, uh, if someone uh, offends you or hits you or whatever. You're supposed to turn the other cheek and let him slap you on the other cheek. You know, the one that you say, they, they deny that Jesus even died on the cross. They say that that's a complete fallacy. If all the Christians would turn the other cheek, they would have been annihilated years ago. You know, but uh, that's what they say. But what I wrote about was about the power of a violent sacrifice. What Stephen did when he was stoned to death uh, was an amazing thing. And... Uh, you know, St. Paul was there holding the clothes of the people that killed Stephen. They took him out and stoned him to death. I've seen a video of stoning to death from Iraq, when I, from Iran, when I, was, when I was in Turkey, and it's a horrible thing to see, to watch. And uh, there, was, uh, there was two women that had got caught in adultery, and uh, they took the men that had been caught with them and gave them a thorough beating with a rod about as thick as my thumb and three feet long. They beat them strongly with it. And, uh, and then they took the women and they covered them with a, uh, some kind of a cloth bag uh, that went all the way down past their waist. And they dug a hole in the ground and... and uh, uh, put them in up to their waist in the ground and filled it in with dirt. And then they proceeded to have a whole crowd of people throwing rocks about the size of a baseball at them. And uh, one of them got conked in the head and passed out, but the other one somehow got her shroud ripped. And, uh, and they, uh, you could see her face. She was frantic and trying to dodge it, but she, there was no way. And uh, where coming to a place where you can't expect that our future is going to be all about going to Disneyland, you know? And I'm not against Disneyland. My kids have been there. But uh, there's rough things that are coming. And it's good to have a sense, a, a, a realization that... The people who started this thing, Peter and John and the apostles, they paid with their lives. And this thing is coming full circle. And we have to make our minds up. Are we committed? Are we committed? If you're not committed to Jesus, if you're not committed to the gospel, if what you're looking for in life is an extra big piece of cake brought to you on a silver platter, uh, you're going to be disappointed because that's not what God calls us to. He calls us to carry in your cross. And we all have a cross, everybody. And Jesus said, if you won't take up your cross and follow me, that uh, you're not worthy of me. And, and so anyway, we have got to, to look at this. I talked about progressions and regressions that 
when the gospel first, and I'm going to try to get into this in a few minutes, in a couple more minutes, when the gospel first began to be presented, it came with power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, it came with uh, healings, and not just somebody getting healed of a backache or a headache. I mean, you're talking about what we read a little while earlier, Peter and John coming into the temple, and here's a man uh, that was uh, not a young man at all, and he had been uh, crippled from his birth, unable to walk completely, and, and Peter laid his eyes on him, and the man was asking for money, and Peter said, I don't have any money, but what I have, I'm going to give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand, and the man was instantly healed. And uh, there's another instance uh, I'm going to read in a few minutes about people uh, being raised from the dead. And, uh, you know, all kinds of powerful things that happened back in those days. And we want that now. You know, we read the stories, we want it now, we want to see it, and basically we're not seeing it, but we want to see it. And, you know, those things did not instantly stop. Uh, when Peter healed that man, that was not the last one that was healed. But there was an apostolic period of about 70 years from the time that Jesus died until the death of the last of the apostles, which was St. John, that in that period was that it was known as the apostolic period and the things that we celebrate today were happening back then and then there was a regression there was a gradual regression where that didn't happen anymore you, you I've got uh, books at home called the the uh, pre-Nicene the anti with well, A-N-T-E not against but before the Nicene Council fathers uh, ministers preachers who preached the gospel after the apostles had died. Some of them were taught by the apostles. And, and uh, they wrote, I've got two books about that thick of writings from these folks. And when you read what they wrote, there wasn't anything apostolic about it. There wasn't any, anybody getting the Holy Ghost. There wasn't, they were still baptizing in Jesus' name, but there wasn't uh, any healings. The kind of healings that were taking place uh, was... Oh, miraculous statues that were weeping, you know, that were seen to having tears coming out of the statues and stuff like this. I mean, it was not of the caliber of what was going on when the apostles were here. And that was a regression. But we are wanting, we are desiring, people are preaching, people are praying, looking for the return of these powerful demonstrations of the Spirit of God and so many people, a whole lot smarter and a whole lot uh, better reputation than me, are saying that it's going to happen. And, uh, and in some places it is. But there is a progression that we're moving towards these things starting to happen. And we've got to come to a realization also that while we want that, that it comes with a price. The apostles paid dearly uh, in the face of the government and in the face of people that hated them. They paid dearly while God showered blessings on them and power on them and gave them authority uh, in these ways. And as we're getting closer and closer to the time when Jesus is going to return, uh, I, you know, I expect that we are going to see if if you're going to get the one, you're going to get the other as well. Paul said that, oh, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. You know, we want to know the Lord Jesus in the power of his resurrection. But he also said in the same setting and in the fellowship of his suffering. They come together, you know. If, you want to be a, if you're a man and you want to be a muscle man, you've got to get in the gym and do some serious work with the weights. You have got to build up those muscles. They are not going to get there uh, just because you want to have them. And it's the same in the case of the gospel. You know, if we are truly looking for God to empower us, it's going to come with a price. And, 
and it's a good thing that we should realize that. And uh, because if you, if you're, if all you're looking for is God to, uh, as one person said, I would believe him if he would make a large deposit in a, in a numbered Swiss bank account in my name, then I would really believe God, you know. If that's all you're looking for, you know, is for God to let you drive a Lamborghini, if all you're looking for is for God to put a million bucks in your bank account, if all you're looking for is for you to have great power, uh, I knew a guy one time who went on a 40-day fast, and uh, the pastor asked him, what are you on a 40-day fast for? You know, you're you're down on your bed now, and the guy had already been something like 20 days on it. And he said, you can't even get out of bed at this point. How are you going to get another 40 days, another 20 days? What are you fasting for? He said, I'm fasting so that anybody I lay hands on will be healed, and anybody that I lay hands on will get the Holy Ghost immediately. And uh, the pastor told him, you better start eating because you're going to lay here and die. You just want, you just want for you, you want to have the pride of standing up there and being important and everybody looking at you God's not going to give it to you like that you know and and we have got to we have got to realize that if we want the power of his resurrection we're going to also have to have the fellowship of his suffering it comes together in the same verse it's in the same chapter it's that it came from the same messenger and you know are you willing to pay the price are you are you counting the cost? You know, Jesus said, you know, that, that if you put your hand to the plow and then you turn back, you're not worthy. You're not worthy of him. You know, it's one thing to start out, you know, to say, yes, I want it. But uh, it's another thing entirely to complete the process, amen, to come to the end of the day when, God can look to you and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, that's what we ought to be after is, amen, doing the will of God. Praise the Lord. Now, let's get back to the lesson. Hallelujah. Well, I guess we were on the lesson. Okay. Let's look in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Here's the Apostle Paul saying, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You notice in, in this is King James, but it says believeth. Now a lot of the modern translations say believes, but that believeth, E-T-H, is the present perfect tense. And what it means is that he believes and he continues to believe. You know, it's not enough just to make a one statement that I believe and, and there you are, you know. But you've got to keep the faith that he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, what is the gospel? In one sense, we look at the four Gospels, uh, known by that name, that uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote those four books that tell the story of Jesus, basically, uh, from four different perspectives. And, and in one sense, that's the Gospel. But there is one place in the Bible that actually gives a definition of what the Gospel is, and... Uh, and that is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And verses 1 through 4. And this is Paul again speaking. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, 
and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then it goes on to talk about all the people who personally witnessed the resurrection of the Lord Jesus after he uh, was raised from the dead. At one point it talks there about above 500 people at one time that Jesus appeared to, and I believe that was just before he ascended into heaven. But uh, there is the gospel in a nutshell. It is basically the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now, we celebrate it here uh, understanding that when Jesus died, that that is uh, something that we uh, take part in when we repent of our sins, that there is no one, I don't care how good a two-shoes of a person you are, there is no one that has never messed up. Everybody has messed up. We have all messed up. In a number of places in the scripture, God says, you know, that, that all have sinned and come short of the glory. And, uh, and, in, and it talks in the Old Testament about there's none that does good, nobody. That, that all of us have a, an, a preclusion. We have a tendency to f do something that's not right. You know, we see something and we want it and we do something bad to get it. Or somebody treats us bad and we're going to treat them worse, you know. And whatever it is, there's all different kinds of ways to mess up and... and uh, all of us have done it at some point in time, and everybody has got to come to the place where they realize that they're a sinner and that they've got to be sorry for it. That even the courts of law are looking for that out of criminals. They want you to be sorry, and if you'll be sorry that you did something bad, they'll likely give you a lesser punishment. But God, uh, in his goodness, gives us that opportunity to share in his death by dying out to that rotten instinct that we have inside of us by telling God we're sorry. We got to tell him. Amen. You know, I, when, I, when I used to take care of, when I had my kids, I raised my kids, I only had one rule, and that is do what I tell you. And uh, as long as they did what I told them, they were all right. And if they didn't, well, they had to pay. And the first thing I wanted out of them if they did something wrong was to say they were sorry. And... Uh, well, anyway, that's God's plan for us is that humanity needs to be sorry when they've messed up. And it's a natural thing to mess up. Everybody messes up. And then we celebrate further uh, God's burial. The Lord Jesus was buried after he died. They put him in the tomb. And we celebrate that by going up and getting baptized. There's a lot of different Ways you could get baptized in that pool up there. I've baptized people in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea. And uh, I've known people who got baptized in a bathtub. And there's a lot of different places you could go. But uh, basically, when you get buried, they don't just take you out here to Whitechapel Cemetery and sprinkle some dirt on you. They put you in the ground. And uh, that's what getting buried is all about. And we are buried with the Lord in baptism. That's what we do. And then we rise with him. We take part in his resurrection. He talks about rise to walk in newness of life. Peter said uh, on the day of Pentecost, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When, when God's spirit comes inside of you, it resurrects your life. It's a, it's a form of resurrection, and that's what the gospel is all about. It's about the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and that's something we got to believe in. Praise God. Can you say amen? amen. It's true anyway. Praise God. But I want to talk to you about progressions, that we're moving in a direction. Uh, you know, there was... We're moving in a positive direction. A progression is moving onward, positive, uphill. Uh, when you look at history, you go back and you see people receiving the Holy Ghost and, uh, and so on back in the days of the Bible, and it talks about it. And you look in history, and that thing gradually waned. 
And, uh, you know, the, the Roman government was hard on persecution against Christians. Just being found to be a Christian, they would take you into the, into the Colosseum or one of the, the arenas, and they would uh, force you to make an offering to Caesar, uh, who they claimed was a god. And you had to offer incense on the altar to Caesar. And if you wouldn't do it, they would kill you. And, uh, and they, uh, some, there was two different emperors of the Romans that made a claim that they had completely wiped out the Christian religion. And there was none of them left. But uh, it wasn't as easy as they thought. And it kept coming back. And it came to the point that actually one of the Roman emperors, Constantine, converted to being a Christian. But by that time, Christianity was not what it used to be. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of the things that we read about in the book of Acts weren't happening anymore. And thousands of years went by. And you can read in history, there are a few examples. Uh, there was some uh, people called the little children of Cervens back about the 15 and 1400s in France that uh, those people were receiving the Holy Ghost and the king of France was killing them uh, because they weren't uh, going along with his idea of what it was to be a Christian. And uh, the adults were basically in serious trouble. And what happened was little children, little seven, eight, nine-year-old children started receiving the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. And, uh, and the king was hard-pressed to kill the little children, and uh, they called them little prophets, and they would get up and prophesy, little, little children, but uh, that was a, an isolated incident. You didn't hear much about it. You go back and look, you know, 200, 300, 400 years ago, 500, 1,000 years ago, you didn't hear the doctrine being preached like it was in the New Testament like we can hear today, and, but there was a gradual progression, moving back out of the dark ages, moving back to, <clears throat> to uh, uh, God's ways. Now, there are some other instances that you can read about in history. There was a man by the name of, of uh, John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist Church, and he had a brother named Charles, and uh, they were both given to praying. They prayed hours and hours every day, and, uh, and they said that Charles, John's brother, uh, spoke ecstatic utterances, they called it. He said things he didn't understand and nobody else understood that God had given him that. But it was an isolated thing until about 120 years ago, 115 years ago, it started happening across the world on, on a, uh, uh, increasing, an increasing uh, uh, amount of people that started receiving the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, the way that it was seen back in the book of Acts. And it has gradually increased from then. But even so, we're looking for, for God to continue and to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Praise God. And when we talk about a progression, okay, now, I received the Holy Ghost when I was seven years old. Uh, that was uh, a little over 60 years ago. And back then, the way to get the Holy Ghost uh, was that you got down on your knees and you said hallelujah about four million times. Or you said Jesus about three million times or whatever. Six million times, he just kept saying it over again. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, sometimes there was a few other things. And you said it until something happened. And I remember my own personal experience that, I mean, my parents were after me, you know, to receive the Holy Ghost. And I was up praying, you know, after service uh, uh, on church, church nights and so on. And I remember praying, you know, the normal way, Jesus, 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 and so on. And they had told me that if you expected to get the Holy Ghost, you had to give 100%. And uh, so I got it in my little mind that I would give 100%. And 
And I prayed just as hard as I could pray. And I realized while I'm praying in myself, I realized this is it. I have, this is as much as I can give. And I told God, I said, this is all I got, God. This is 100%. And then immediately, within just a few seconds, I realized I wasn't talking English anymore. And uh, that's how it happened to me. But uh, it, was, it was not an easy process. And I suppose it's like getting born. You know, when a baby is born, he's got a hard time pressing you got to press your way into this life. You know, it's hard on the mother, and it's hard on the baby to get born. And it's the same with the kingdom of God, that you have to press your way into it. you got to get born. It's not necessarily easy. But uh, anyway, when I was in my, my 20s, about my middle 20s, uh, this was basically still the way that people received the Holy Ghost, that they prayed, you know, that way, and uh, I had brought some people to church, and they prayed for probably a year's time. Every service night, they went up and prayed after church, and uh, they had not received the Holy Ghost after a year of praying, and we had another guy in our, in our church that uh, had been praying for five years and had not received the Holy Ghost, and they put out a message saying that Billy Cole was coming to town, and if there was anybody in your church uh, that hadn't received the Holy Ghost, that uh, they should take him to this meeting he was having, and, uh, and they would receive the Holy Ghost. And uh, so anyway, we took all these people, there are a number of people from the church there that uh, had never received the Spirit, and... Uh, and he had a different way of doing things. He said, now in the book of Acts, it said when the Holy Ghost came, they were all sitting. He said, so we're, gonna, we're, going, to, uh, we're going to have everybody sit. Come up on the platform. We'll set some chairs out. And everybody who wants the Holy Ghost, come up here. And we're going to uh, have them all sit in the chairs. And we're going to pray. And uh, so he did that. And he would get them started. And uh, I'm running out of time. And, uh, and they would start to pray, and then he would stop them. And then he would say a few words to encourage them and to, you know, exhort them. And then after a little bit, he'd let them pray again. And uh, he'd let them pray for a few minutes, maybe five at the most, and then he'd stop again. And uh, about the third time that he did that, I noticed there was a change in how these guys were praying. And, uh, and he got... All the people who said that they felt like in their heart that God was, they had faith God was going to give these people the Holy Ghost. He wanted them to come around them, stand behind them, and uh, lay hands on them and pray for them. And he had them start again. I believe it was the fourth time he had them start. And he said, now I'm going to, this time, I'm going to give the word of faith. He called it the word of faith. And when I say the word of faith, then we want everybody to praise God and all these people to praise God. And he did that. And all of a sudden, this guy who had prayed every night for five years was talking in tongues. And these two guys that had prayed for a solid year and wore me out a bunch of times helping them, they were talking in tongues. And I forget how many there was. It was 37 or some great number of people that, uh, that received the Holy Ghost that night. And it was a different way. Now, Billy Cole went on to be an uh, a missionary in Thailand and then in Ethiopia and there was, uh, this thing progressed, and uh, there was a progression of this thing to the point that uh, in Ethiopia, uh, there was tens of thousands of people getting the Holy Ghost in one service at, when this, at using his method. Now, he, got a, he took a lot of flack from people. I, I met him in, in New York City. Uh, where he was uh, ministering at the Bethel Church, where Pastor is today. And uh, I just so happened that uh, we were staying in the same hotel uh, because back then I could, my, my stepson uh, worked for Marriott and I could stay at the, the fancy Marriott for 30 bucks. And uh, anyway, uh, we were getting ready to go and uh, I went down in the lobby waiting on my wife and here was Billy Cole sitting there. So I went up and talked to him. And I told him, you know, 
how glad I was for uh, him, you know, uh, and, uh, and the ministry that he had and how these two friends of mine had got the Holy Ghost and other people from our church had got the Holy Ghost with his word of faith. He said, you don't know how much flack I took from that. He said, I'm glad that you're happy. He said, but not everybody was happy when I brought that out because they wanted to do it the old way. They didn't want to have the word of faith and people get the Holy Ghost. But just like, and I'm not trying to sell books and I'm not trying to promote myself here, but just like I believe there's a progression that uh, uh, is going to happen with this evil that's taking place in the world right now, there is also going to be a progression. Do you realize when God first poured out the Holy Ghost on the book of, in the book of Acts, Acts 2 and 4, there was no preacher. They were all sitting there in one accord, and they had been praying, but there was no preacher preaching. And all of a sudden, there came a sound like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where there, and, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and uh, it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. That was the initial inf instance when the Holy Ghost was poured out uh, in the New Testament era. There was no preacher. It just happened. God just came in and poured it out. Now, I've seen a similar thing here with one person. I had a cousin uh, named Linda who was, had a lot of trouble in her life, and she came here. It's been uh, about 15 years ago. She came here, and uh, it was maybe 16 years ago, and, and Mark Reed was pastor, and she was having a lot of trouble, and nobody knew it there except me and her sister. And anyway, uh, he said, anybody who's got trouble in your life, Pastor Reed said, I want you to come up to the front and form a straight line. He was a big, big on straight lines. He said, I want you to form a straight line up here at the front. And my cousin went up there, and uh, he said, now, he said, we want to praise God. I want everybody just to, in the line, just lift up your hands and praise God. She lifted up her hands and started talking in tongues. You know, I had brought that girl to Sunday school from the time I was a young kid, from, from the time my parents used to drive her, and then when I got to drive, and I would drive her to Sunday school. But she never got the Holy Ghost until she got in that straight line. And uh, I believe that we are headed for a place where God is going to just come into and just start pouring the Holy Ghost on people. It's going to start happening. It's going to be just pouring out. We're moving in that direction. And, 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 but don't think that there's no price. There's a price. Amen. There's a price to pay. You know, if you want to get the goods, you're going to have to pay. One time, one time I had uh, the Lord speak to me, and I'm closing here, uh, but I had the Lord speak to me, and I had, there was something that I wanted really, really bad. And it came to me that I should fast. Some things that you need to fast and pray in order to get. And uh, I felt like that uh, I was supposed to fast for three days. Well, I fasted for one day, and I got hungry, and I went out and had some pizza. And, uh, and anyway, then it came to me in my prayers that, uh, you know, this person that you've been praying for, what you're doing is uh, uh, you're digging her grave with your fork while you're eating your pizza and your cake. You know, you need to get busy, and uh, you're going to have to fast again. And uh, then it came to my attention in my prayer that this time I had to fast for seven days, and I was praying, God, well, you said it was three days. And then... After a little while, it dawned on me, there's a higher price for direct knowledge. If God is going to give you, tell you right straight, flat out what's going on with your life and what you need, you're going to have to pay extra to get direct knowledge from God. He's not just going to give it to you right off the bat. You know, you, and, and that was when I fasted seven days, things happened and, uh, and lives were changed. And uh, the day that I finished the seventh day, uh,
that person's life change. Now, I don't want anybody to think they need to be fearful with what I was talking about when we started this off about progressions and about uh, the thing that happened in Charleston, South Carolina on Wednesday. I don't want anybody to think uh, that we need to be afraid. And when I wrote this book, at the end of the book, now I'm not a, the kind of person that God talks to all the, t- all the time. I don't very often hear from God. And a lot of times when I think I, d- I did, I, you know, I, I'm careful because I found out when I talk too much, I get in trouble. But when I wrote this book, this was one time that I knew for sure that God had spoke to me. And it's the last, I got it as a message, page number last of this book, what I wrote. And this was all the things going on in my mind about if this is really going to happen. And I wrote in the book, I didn't understand, I didn't know, is it going to be a year, is it going to be 10 years, is it going to be 30 years before we start seeing madmen breaking into the churches and shooting and killing people? I didn't know, but I was worried about it in my mind. And as I closed the book, God spoke to me, and this is what he said. Thus, terror, shock, and abandonment to sin are overcome by my mercy, by my love, and by my grace. That God is able to take bad circumstances and make good come out of them. Amen. You know, there's 30,000 people or so get killed in highway traffic accidents every year in the United States. It's bad business, you know, and all of us are going to die if God doesn't come before our time comes up. But somehow or another, we've got to get past fear, and we've got to dedicate our hearts and our souls toward what it is that God has for us as, as a person, as an individual. Amen. That, that God has a plan. Amen. And it's going to happen. God's will is going to be done. Amen. And every one of us has got a purpose in our life. God has something he wants you to do. In a general way, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But it's actually more specific than that. God has a specific plan for you. How could it possibly be in all the millions of people, billions of people in the world that God knows you individually? But he does. And he says, not one sparrow falls to the ground without my father. And God has a plan for you. He's got something he wants you to accomplish in your life. You know, Anna uh, didn't accomplish God's purpose for her life until the day that she saw him in the temple when his mother brought him in. Uh, His mother and father, mother and Joseph brought him in to the temple and, and that was the day at age 80 that she accomplished her life when she went out and told everybody she could find that the Messiah is here. And and spoke to him to all the about him to all the people in Jerusalem. And so it doesn't matter how old you are, you can still accomplish your purpose or more completely accomplish your purpose in God. But it takes commitment. We've got to commit. Amen. We've got to commit to God. Amen. That it's it's yes, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Sometimes we got to be bold, but we always need to be true to God. Amen. Can you say praise the Lord? I think we got a five-minute break.